like having stuff, it's just the appropriate amount of stuff. The things yes. that enhance our lives, augment our lives, add value to our lives. The problem is we have so many things, it gets in the way of the things that will actually bring us joy. Hey guys, welcome to this episode of the Rachel Curry Show podcast. I am so glad that you're here. So in this episode, we're going to talk about the best and worst money habits. I'll talk about some things that I am loving and learning right now. You'll also hear a conversation I had with the minimalists, Joshua and Ryan, and we're going to talk about five signs you're a hoarder and how it's costing you money. Okay, when you hear the word hoarder, you're probably thinking about that crazy TLC show, But there are a few things that actually may shock you. So you do not want to miss this conversation. But first, let's talk about what it takes to become a successful millionaire. These are small habits that can change it all. Not to mention, anyone can do it. So let's dive in. All right, I hear a lot of people say things like, well, there's just no way I can be wealthy. There's no way I could become a millionaire listen, I'm a teacher or I'm a police officer. Like, there's just no way. And it's interesting because very few Americans today truly believe that they have what it takes to become wealthy. But today I'm going to show you why that's totally false. And then I'll give you some tips for how you can successfully become a millionaire. So our company, Ramsey Solutions, did the largest survey of millionaires ever with over 10,000 people that participated in this survey who have a net worth of a million dollars. And here's what's so fascinating. The top five careers for millionaires in that study were engineer, accountant, teacher, someone in business management or a management role, and an attorney. It's fascinating. It's not like, oh, some big successful, you know, celebrity or, you know, fill in the blank. The average person out in America, those were the top five careers of them having a net worth of over a million dollars. And also what was found is that 79% of those millionaires didn't get any inheritance from family. So over 10,000 millionaires said, yep, eight out of 10 of them said they got nothing from family. So that kind of proves the whole, like, well, you have to be born into a rich family in order to become wealthy. Not true for eight out of 10 of those people. It's fascinating. Okay, so let's look at a few examples of how you, anyone out there, can really retire a millionaire. So the median household income in the U.S. today is around $67,000. So let's say you invested 15% of your income into retirement vehicles like a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA starting at age 30 until the typical age of retirement around 67. That means you'll be investing $10,000 every single year. And with the annual rate of return being 12%, which I know is not 12% now, but on average, that's what you can get overall, you will have over $6.8 million by the time you retire. And let's just, what if if I was half wrong? What What if I was half wrong? Still not too shabby. Still not too shabby. And even if your income or, again, the annual rate of return were less, And even if you started later than 30, you can still mathematically end up a millionaire by continuing to invest at least 15% of your income into retirement in things like good growth stock mutual funds. So here are other things that just regular people who have built wealth and become millionaires, here are habits that they have in their life that let them to continue to build wealth and keep it. They understand that their income is their largest wealth building tool. So no weird, trendy investment strategies or, oh, if I put my money here. So that means when your income comes in, you have your income and you get to decide what to do with it and where it goes. So you can give it, you can spend it, you can invest it. And you actually have money to invest versus when you're living paycheck to paycheck and your income comes in and it's going back out in bills, whether it's car payments, student loan, credit cards, all that, then you don't have as much money left over to go and say, hey, I want to invest or I want to give or I want to spend. So when you look at your income as the thing that's going to help you build wealth, when your income comes in, you get to decide what to do with it. That's when everything changes. And that's not like an emotional value statement that I'm going to just give you an opinion. Like that's math. (laughs) When you have more money from your paycheck that you get to decide what to do with it, Over time, if you put it in things that your money grows in, you're going to grow your money, which means you're going to build wealth. Also, they make and stick to a monthly budget. 
there's this idea that, okay, you know, I, I just, I work too hard to look at every single penny or I just want to enjoy my life. Listen, being on a budget, it, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy your life. Being on a budget just means that you have a plan and you know what's happening. So these people that have built wealth over time, it didn't just accidentally happen. They know when they're very, very aware of where their money's going. There is intention behind it. It's really important. Also, they have long-term vision for investing. So they are patient. They know it's long-term. They're not freaking out like right now what the market's doing. Sure, it's crazy, right? It's And it's kind of gone down some and all of this, right? But when you're investing for the long-term, you know, okay, so it's going to do this maybe for a year or two. But I'm not worried about right now. I'm looking way ahead. I'm looking out there out there in the future. When that's your mindset, you don't make fear-based decisions. Also, they live below their means. Our National Study of Millionaires found that 94% of millionaires live on less than they make. And you're probably thinking, well, of course they do. They're millionaires. <laughs> They're able to. They had that habit. That's what allowed them to become millionaires. When you live above your means and you spend more than what you make, you don't have the margin to go and invest. When you live below your means and you're able to save and invest, that is how they and you can build wealth. Also, they do not take money out of their 401k until it's time to retire. This is a big one. Do not take a loan out on your 401k. Don't cash out before. Don't think, oh, I should you know, cash this out to pay off my debt even or fill in the blank. No, you don't touch it. You don't touch it until you get to the age of retirement. Also, they stay away from get-rich-quick schemes. There's going to be things constantly, you guys, that you're going to hear of, oh, yeah, if you just do this and do this, you know, don't just invest. That's so boring and so, you know, blah. Go and do this big thing because you put your money here and it's going to give you all this rate of return. Things are going to look shiny. They're going to look shiny. But I'm telling you, be consistent and don't, all the flashy stuff, don't go and just say, oh, yeah, that looks exciting over there. Stay consistent. Stay consistent. Also, they work together with their spouse if they're married. This is a big thing to say, okay, long term, we are one team. We are going to build our life together, and that includes our money. Also, they meet regularly with an investment pro. 68% of millionaires in the study said they worked with a financial advisor or investment pro to make their retirement dreams happen. And I love this. Anytime there's anything complicated when it comes to personal finance or kind of intimidating, and again, this could be insurance, this could be taxes, this could be investing, have someone in your corner who knows this stuff in and out, okay? These people, they study it, they know what's best, and if they follow Ramsey Solutions and our principles, they're gonna know how to help you long-term. And so this is really key to have someone in your corner, again, who breathes this stuff in day in and day out. So I just hope this gives you some encouragement that you can, you can retire a millionaire by being intentional. You don't have to win the lottery or anything like that. Anyone can become a millionaire, including you. It's going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. It's steady, steady, steady. But the more consistent you are, you guys, again, mathematically, it pans out for you. And so that's why I'm so huge on the baby steps and getting you, you know, wanting you to be out of debt and having a fully funded emergency fund. So that way you can invest 15% of your income into retirement. And if you want to learn more about all of this, you can check out my dad, Dave Ramsey, his new book, Baby Steps Millionaires. It's amazing. I will leave a link in the show notes for you. I love books. I love to read. And getting your hands on something that actually can help your life is everything. And I'm so excited because today my friends Joshua and Ryan are here, aka the minimalists. They've been here before. If you don't know them, you'll love them. They've helped over 20 million people learn how to live a meaningful life with less through their website, their books, their podcasts, and their Netflix films, which is how I actually saw you guys the very first time <laughs> in the documentary. And so again, they've been here, but they're back because they always just have great stuff to talk about. So I'm really excited uh, oh. to talk to you guys and excited to talk about a partnership at the end of this episode. Heck yeah. We're done with you guys. Thanks so, for having us. So glad you're back. We're glad to be here. Yeah, so great. Okay, so... One of the topics you guys talk about is hoarding. Yes. And I feel like when you hear that word, you think of like the TLC show, you know, and all of this kind of the craziness, not just how the everyday American could be a hoarder. So yeah. 
Let's talk about that. So how do you kind of define hoarding? Oh, man, so hoarding really is the uh, inability to let go of excess stuff. Someone who can't let go of anything, that's like a clear sign of, of someone being a hoarder. And yes, you're right. Like we think of the TLC show and we can point and we can laugh and we can be like, oh, look at those. They're crazy. I'm not. Exactly. <laughs> like I'm not a hoarder. Yeah. But it's interesting. Like when you look at the actual signs of hoarding, a level one hoarder, this is what it takes to be a level one hoarder. Light amount of clutter in several rooms and no noticeable odors. That's Stop. a level one hoarder. That's level one. Yeah, like Shoot. I was definitely a level one hoarder. <laughs> okay, what are the stages? You want to talk about, so you, you talked about the first stage. Yes. Yes. There's light clutter in multiple rooms. Yes. No noticeable odors. Mm -hmm. Right, I noticed a slight no. odor right now. <laughs> no noticeable I stopped wearing deodorant odor. years ago, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk oh, about stage two. Okay, yeah, so uh, stage two is overflowing trash cans and um, unclean food prep surfaces. So okay. I know certainly I have been there with overflowing trash cans and I got a little, you know, cutting board area where where, uh, yeah, just last night's fit. I'm like, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and leave it. So I certainly could consider myself a stage two hoarder at, at times. Yes. Yeah. And now stage three is you have at least one inaccessible room or unusable room. Mm -hmm. Because of stuff. Because it's mm. filled with excess stuff. Yeah. Does the garage count? Yes, it <gasps> definitely counts. Oh. So here, here's that, that's a big one, y'all. It's oh, yeah. always funny to me that I'm like, like you, we will just put junk in a garage and are like like a nice car mm -hmm. out in the driveway. Right. Where I'm like, shouldn't it be like the <laughs> yeah. opposite? Everything goes in the garage except what it was made for. Yeah, that's right. right. That's right. That's I right. used to have a two and a half car garage. I don't even know what that means. What is a half yeah. car? <laughs> it's really just a hoarding factory, a mausoleum full of stuff. Mm. And it'd be great if those things were increasing our joy, our happiness, making our lives better. But we know the opposite. Mm. It's clutter when it gets in the way. Well, in the way of what? In the way of living a meaningful life. We have all of this stuff that's all around us because we got a lot of internal clutter as well. Yes. And so I was definitely a hoarder, and I think most people who are hoarders don't actually recognize mm -hmm. that they're some level of hoarding. And it's not a bad thing. It's just recognizing that it's getting in the way mm. and it's time to let go. We see the people on the, the TV shows, those are level five hoarders. Yes. Mm. And there's a significant problem there. Exits are blocked or there's like excrement around the house. Yes. And it's easy to kind of sneer and be like, oh, that's not me. But the truth is, yeah, it is me. It didn't take them, it didn't happen overnight, right? Mm -hmm. And may, I may never reach that level of hoarding, but I certainly, I was a, a stage three hoarder. It's interesting because Josh was like the most well-organized hoarder I had ever seen. <laughs> he had like totes and bins and containers for everything. Um, he had He's like, a label hoarder. Yeah, <laughs> right. He's, well, which is interesting because, you know, a, a lot of hoarders, they fall on the OCD spectrum. You wouldn't think that. Interesting. Because when you think of like obsessive compulsive, you think of like uh, Spartanism, people yeah. who can't uh, hold on to things. But really, it's on the same type of spectrum. So Josh, my very good OCD friend, he, uh, yeah, boxes and bins. And then I'll never forget the magazines that he had stacked up. That was like, it was in the correct order with the month and the year. And yeah, it was. Uh, All of it. It was incredible. It was, it was almost pleasant to look at, but it certainly was getting in the way. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so normal, though, right? Yeah, like, it is, like, yeah. like so many people watching and listening. It's like, oh yeah, that's kind of how my garage feels, or my mm -hmm. life feels, or I keep that just in case. Mm -hmm. And what I love so much about, about your message, like deep to the soul of it, is that we just believe that this thing or this stuff is going to fulfill some part of my life, right? Yeah. And then you go on top of that, the financial side of not having the money, and you're still doing it because you think this stuff is going to make me happy. Mm -hmm. And it's just removing all of that. And mm -hmm. I love that so much because it's the truth. It it's is. the truth. And we have to tell ourselves or remind ourselves constantly because we live in a world, or I do, where I'm like, yeah, you, you still fall into the trap of, okay, if I just had three more of that, yeah, I'll feel safe and secure, or I'm going to need that later. You justify it, but you guys are, it's like, get it out. Get yeah. out. Don't be a hoarder. Yeah. Don't have clutter. Yeah. What you're talking about is consumerism. Consumerism mm, yes. is the ideology that buying something is going to make me better, happier, or more complete. Mm. But often, the things incomplete us. Now, Ryan and I, as the minimalists, you know, people will call into our podcast all the time, and they think that simply getting rid of everything is also going to make them happy. Well, that's the opposite. That's just another form of consumerism huh. in a way. We like having stuff. It's just the appropriate amount of stuff. The things yes. that enhance our lives, augment our lives, add value to our lives— the problem is when we have so many things, it gets in the way of the things that will actually bring us joy. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so what are the areas around someone's house that they can kind of say, okay, I have clutter. 
clutter here, clutter there. It might be a stage <laughs> one hoarder. Are there areas? Uh, certainly. I mean, you know, there's kitchen clutter, right? Yeah. I mean, I remember when I was going through uh, my whole experiment with, I packed up everything I owned uh, to, and then unpacked as I needed it. You can that. find that story at theminimalists.com. Um, but yeah, I remember I had, you know, 20 or 30 coffee mugs. <laughs> and, and, and and Josh is like putting some of those in the, in the donation box. I'm like, what are you doing, man? I gotta, I gotta make sure I don't unpack. He's like, are you gonna unpack 20 mugs? <laughs> and like, it was just, he holds up one, it says like world's greatest granddad or something, you know? It's like, <laughs> but, but you know, I drank coffee. Yep. So I'm like, of course I'm gonna hold it. So your kitchen's a great place to start. Um, kitchen's great. Yeah, where else, Josh? Well, I mean, any flat surface. So bathroom counters, that's yes. the easy place mm. because things just accumulate. Anywhere you have a flat surface, it, it becomes this, this, I call them clutter coffins. It's inviting. Uh huh. We, we keep <laughs> where putting. Where you go to die? Where the sun goes to die? <laughs> yes. like you'll never all of the and we just set it there, right? Yeah. And and all of a sudden, this beautiful, pristine space is fully cluttered within a day, a week, a month, and so. What I do is I look for any of these flat surfaces. So the bathroom is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. Another great place is the sort of bedroom, the dressers, or the yeah. nightstand. There's a lot of nightstand clutter that we have yes. to deal with, right? So yep. it's just, I'll just set this here. I'll just set this here. And before we know it, it's full of clutter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or the junk drawer. Do you have a junk drawer? Oh, my gosh. How many and do you have? Mm. Okay. Well, you said the <laughs> nightstand, and this is where I felt convicted. Because I do, I... Oh my gosh, I feel like we have so much to talk about. Okay, so there, <laughs> is, a, it, there is something to be said, and everyone feels this, when you walk into a room or a home and there's not a lot on the counters. That's why when you show your house like to sell it, the, the agents like take everything off the counter, everything off. Because yeah. when you walk in, there's just like a piece, right? Speaks to exactly what y'all talk about. When you yeah. just don't have a bunch of crap around, yeah. you walk in and you feel good. So mm -hmm. I want that feeling, and I know that feeling because I have done what you guys teach, mm. and I really do try to take things away. So the nightstands, mm. every, I'm like, I have my water bottle, my book, a lamp, and some decor stuff, whatever. Mm. And that's it. But then it starts to clutter. Mm -hmm. And some stuff, it's easy to get rid of. So I'm like, oh yeah, the coffee mug from last night, from Shit, yesterday, right. yeah, and right. here, an empty water bottle, the girls, my kids have stuff. Mm -hmm. But here's where I get bad, y'all, the junk drawer. The drawer under my nightstand. It's the catch-all. It's the catch-all. I literally will like <laughs> open it, I'm like, here's a random bead that my seven-year-old's probably gonna yell at me, you know, and I'm like, here, just here, here, here. Just so I can, it can look nice, but I have issues underneath. That mm. probably speaks to my soul, too. Oh, it's uh, easy. Underneath the nightstand, but the junk drawer, and then, it, and then I go through and I'm like, and it's just crap. It's just yeah. crap that builds up. Mm -hmm. And why in that split moment, I don't just throw it away. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I need to catch Rachel. I need to catch myself in the moment. Why? Tell I me, Joshua. Tell, tell me, Joshua. Tell me. Three words. <laughs> the three most dangerous words in the English language, just in case. <laughs> I'll just throw this in this drawer just in case. Now, what we're really saying is I don't want to deal with this right now. 100%. But we justify in our mind by saying, ah, you know what? Just in case, right? And so what happens is that allows us to hold on to hundreds or thousands mm -hmm. or tens of thousands mm -hmm. of just in case mm -hmm. items. Ryan and I came up with something called the 2020 rule, the just in case rule. Anything you own that you're holding on to just in case you might need it someday in some non existent hypothetical future, <laughs> mm -hmm. no. you can let go of it because you can replace it for less than $20 in less than 20 minutes. Yeah. Now, at first, you're like, oh my God, I don't want to go around every day spending $20 on every single. You never have to use the, the rule. That's the thing. Yeah. You never end up replacing these never things did. you let go of. Between the two of us, we've had to use this rule five times in the last 10 years. Yeah. That, so it costs us about 100 bucks to get rid of tens of thousands of things that were just in the way. A low price to pay to get rid of all that stuff. We lived For in the sure. middle of nowhere, Montana. Like one stoplight within 1,200 square miles. Yes. And it still worked even in that little town. You can find what you need. Yeah. That's the great thing about yeah. 2022, right? If yeah. you need it, you can find it. That's right. Yeah. Oh, we have moved go. from like a culture of uh, ownership to a culture of access. Yes, yeah. absolutely. It's so good. Mm. So good. Okay, so if someone's watching or listening and they're thinking, oh yeah, I'm definitely stage one, maybe creeping up stage two, mm -hmm. maybe some stage three hoarders <laughs> out there. What are like the first couple of things they can do <sighs> well, to start this process? First, I want to say um, I too is a stage one, stage two hoarder. So <laughs> I have some empathy for the, the hoarders out there. Man, you know, the first place to start is to really ask yourself a question. How might my life be better with less? Like, this is the really, this is the crux of it. Like, getting clear on how uh, simplifying can make you happy. Because it's, or at least make room for happiness. Maybe that's the way of looking at it. Yeah. It's not getting rid of stuff doesn't just make you happy, like Josh was alluding to earlier. And that's where people get caught up, because they don't know why they want to get rid of So that question really helps people get to the root of why. Now, as far as, like, practical first steps, like, moving beyond that, that, that philosophy part of it. Yeah. 
we got the thing called the 30-day minimalism game. You wrote about this in your book. So good, y'all. It's, yes. a, it's so a great good. place to start. Um, so the way it works is you find a friend or a family member or a, a mortal enemy, whoever you want. Just, <laughs> they just also need to get rid of stuff. And you, you, play this, you agree to play this game and start on the first day of the month. And on the first day, you get rid of one thing. And then on the second day, you get rid of two things. And then on the third day, three things. And then, All right, so you get the point by now. It starts out really, really easy. My wife and I, we do this every, uh, every other year probably. Yeah? Yeah, so oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's even as one of the minimalists, this is a tool that I still use. Yes. So whoever makes it to the end of the month wins. Uh, and if both people make it to the end of the month, that's okay. Then both people win because they would have gotten rid of about 500 items. But you can just bet something silly like a, a movie or maybe, you know, the loser has to cook a meal for someone else. But hopefully both people make it to the end of the month and they oh, both yeah. win. Yeah. Rachel, when did it get difficult for you? What day were you like, <laughs> oh, no, day 12. I, and then tomorrow I have to get rid of 13 things. Yeah, you know, I, and I, because it's been over two years because it was at our old house. Because uh-huh. I remember doing it. I remember, mm-hmm. I, like, I think I, I watched the documentary. I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm like, I'm in. I'm, it was before I even knew you guys personally because <laughs> awesome. I was like, this, I'm doing this. And I remember I'm such like an achiever. Then on day one, I was like, oh, I'm going to. I'm going to stack away for extra days. So I, like, made, like, a note of, like, day two. Like, I already, like, had my list of stuff I was going to, like, give away or throw away. I want to say it was, like, day 20. Mm. I mean, I made it pretty far. I, we, but I had never cleaned stuff out. I'm like, we had closets. We had been married 10 years at that point uh-huh. of wedding gifts still, mm. y'all. Like, yeah. a closet yeah. with, with gifts. And I walk in, I'm like, we've literally never used this random vase. And mm. sorry, whoever gave us the vase. But, like, I never used it. It's yeah. not even that. I don't like it. But it's that. We had that crap, y'all. All over. Like, it was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Well, yeah. And it didn't feel like I was a hoarder, or mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I had too much stuff. I felt pretty... No- but then you start digging in, and you open mm-hmm. up drawers. You go under the sink. That's where my stuff... And I'm like, look, stuff that you get from a stocking. Mm-hmm. My mom, my mom's always like, you need this, you need this. <laughs> and it just stacks up over the year. And you're like, what yeah. am I doing? So, anyways, yeah. it's a great game, y'all. Yeah. It's a great game. Yeah. yeah, the problem is you have space to put things. That's it, too. And that's the more space you have, we feel compelled to fill it. Yes. And, uh, yeah, it's easy to do. For sure. The okay. best part is it's, it's a free game, too. So you can download the free calendar on our website. Just go to theminimalists.com slash game, and it's free. You know you don't, have to, you don't have to give us anything in order to play the game, and you can start playing today. Yes, mm-hmm. I love it. Okay, so we're kind of talking about hoarding specifically, but let's just, like, back up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Overall, if someone's not super familiar with your message and you guys, give just kind of an overview of, like, what it is to be a minimalist. What benefits does it give your life overall? Oh, man. You know, what is a minimalist? We're still trying to figure that out. You know, after 10 years, <laughs> eventually we'll figure it out. I mean, it's about living intentionally. Yeah. You know, Josh and I for so long lived unintentional. Uh, you know, we, we were climbing the corporate ladder of success. We did a really good job at that. But, you know, as we were making really good money, we were spending even better money. We got ourselves in heaps of debt. That's really where the journey started uh, for us is we found ourselves just in, in over six figures worth of debt and we were trapped. And we yeah. this, this stressful job that we had, we had to maintain that job to pay for the debt payments that we signed up for. And it was just kind of this vicious cycle. So minimalism, it gave us an opportunity to make room for what was actually important. So for me, when uh, Josh first introduced the, you know, the, the term minimalism to me, at first I'm like, Dude, I don't want to own like less than fifty things. Like that's that, <laughs> right, you know that's right. not that's not me. Like one I'm not, shirt or whatever. Right? Yeah, yeah. Not, I don't want to be a monk. But you know, I found all types of people who um, called themselves minimalists, and they you know they were from all walks of life. Mm-hmm. There's Leo Babauta. He's got eight kids. There's uh, Joshua Becker. Um, he, you know, he was a pastor with a full time job and a house and a car. Uh, Courtney Carver. Um, it was her and uh, her daughter and her husband out in Salt Lake City. Just some like really um, awesome people. And what I noticed, even though the, even though they were from all different walks of life, they all mm-hmm. shared at least two things in common. They uh, they they were living simple lives, and um, they were happy. They were called themselves minimalists. So I'm like, all right, I'm a minimalist. Great. Yeah. So for me, I started with a thing called a packing party. So Josh and I decided to. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Mm-hmm. We decided to pack up all my belongings as if I were moving. Yeah. And then I would unpack only the items I needed over the next three weeks. So this was huge for me. Like, that's really the beginning of it. That's the beginning of the minimalists.com. It's when I was confronted with all my things mm-hmm. and I was really able to um, just get clear on what, what was important to me. Yep. Well, you guys are awesome. Again, love your message. Love you guys. Um, you're and awesome. just everything that y'all do because it is. It, it gives peace and hope to people in a world that the message is the opposite, right? That mm-hmm. we need more and more. And you guys just give such a peaceful message of, yeah, you're good with less. Yeah. You actually have a more intentional life. So yeah. 
I love it. So y'all have done a fun thing with Ramsey Solutions. We have. We've partnered together. So yes. y'all are kind of the catalyst of it. So I want you to kind of talk hmm. about it because uh, I think it came from your y'all's brains, but we, I think it's brilliant. We've worked on a lot of philanthropic projects over the years, uh, about 10 of them. This is, this is our 11th. We've built orphanages. We built a nonprofit grocery co-op on the west side of Dayton, which is one of the largest food deserts in the country. Mm-hmm. And uh, we've done things like build clean water wells and build an elementary school. And one thing that Ryan and I realized growing up, we thought we were so miserable because we didn't have money. And so we had a lot of bad habits around our money growing up. We were poor, but then when we started making money throughout our 20s, we carried those same bad habits forward mm-hmm. and we accumulated a lot of debt. I myself had almost half a million dollars worth of debt at my lowest point. And I realized that I never learned how to be responsible with money. In fact, I learned the opposite. Go out and get credit. You need a good credit score. Go into debt. You'd be dumb not to put it on 3% financing, Mm -hmm. whatever it might be, right? I got to a point where I had 14 credit cards in my wallet because that was a good thing. That's what you're Mm. supposed to do. I was saving money. No, I wasn't. (laughs) I was spending money I never had, right? Mm. And so what we're trying to do is in in, in and around our hometown of Dayton, Ohio, is we're trying to teach every middle school and high school kid the foundations of personal finance, how to be responsible with their money, how to avoid putting themselves in debt when they become adults Mm -hmm. because it's so easy to put yourself into debt. And so we're trying to get everyone in Dayton to avoid that, and we could use your help. Ryan and I are personally financing 100 students, but we can come to you and say, hey, if you have $25, you can literally help one student, mm-hmm. one, middle, one middle school student, or $45 helps a high school student stay out of debt for the rest of their lives because they can learn about the foundations of personal finance, what it means to be debt-free, which is truly the new American dream. For so sure. if people want to contribute, they can. It's just theminimalists.com slash education. And all of that money, 100% of it, goes to teaching these kids about their finances. Which is so huge. I mean, we're all on the education piece too because it's like, yeah, if you learn it, you have that forever. You Mm -hmm. have those tools forever. No matter Mm -hmm. what season of life you're in, no matter what hardship or celebratory season you're in, you know the basics. And when you stick to it consistently over the course of time, it's great. And, And I talk to so many people that are like, I wish I knew this. When I was 17, if I only had known this at 18, my whole life would look different. Even mathematically, we're just investing, right? Just yeah. saving. And the giving you miss out on when you live paycheck to paycheck and there's not margin. The joy of that giving. and I mean, all of it, right? It's yeah. so huge. So yeah. I love that. I love that we get to partner with you guys. and Y'all are incredible. So one thing I always ask my guests on the show is what's one thing you're doing with money right now that's creating a life that you love? Mm. Giving is living, right? Yeah. I mean, Josh and I look for any opportunity to give and that's you know, really uh, the reason behind us partnering with you guys. Not just us giving, but teaching our audience how to give too. Because once you feel like you have enough, and that's what I think minimalism helps people do, that's when we start to look externally. Mm -hmm. So um, certainly, like, just uh, doing these philanthropic projects is really, uh, it's an honor. Hey, how about you, Joshua? Coffee. (laughs) Oh. <laughs> are you like you, you? Are you like a? You enjoy a good cup of coffee. See, I don't have any debt, so I can spend money on good coffee. Whether it's mm. making great coffee at home, yes. or going to a local coffee shop who's passionate about what they do and having that community interaction. Great coffee makes for great conversations. So good. Makes the heart good, too. Get you a little caffeine boost. It's great. That's awesome. Okay, so where can everyone find you guys? Oh, you can just go to theminimalists.com and the podcast and the books and the the documentaries. It's all there. So great. All right, you guys. Thanks so much. Oh, I just love the minimalists, you guys. They're awesome. They are amazing people on And off the microphone, they really are so great. And their message, I just love so, so much. All right. So one thing that I am loving right now is a basil gimlet. Yep. (laughs) A very specific cocktail, but y'all, it's so good. It's my, it's going to be my summer drink, I think. So a gimlet, I've loved just in general. Uh, I think it's a great cocktail, but the basil just adds a little something. So it's simple syrup. It's gin. It's fresh basil that um, I picked from my garden. Yes, I did. Yes, I did. And yeah, you just kind of smash it all together, shake it up, and it is delicious. Oh, and lime juice. Oh my gosh, limes. I don't grow my own limes. That will probably be the next venture that I take on, but lime juice has to be in there too. And it's great. It's just a refreshing, wonderful cocktail. So I'm loving that right now. 
And one thing I am learning is that I can make my own Uncrustables. <laughs> Every parent out there, you probably have had a box of Uncrustables in your freezer and I buy a huge box of them. So if we're on the go, it's the thing I just grab because it's easy. But the other day I was making peanut butter and jellies for my kids at home, like normal ones. And I thought, I, I can make my own. So I took the top of the peanut butter lid, smashed it in the middle, kind of moved it around a little bit, and all the crusts came off because I cut it, basically cut into the bread. And I removed it, and there was my own Uncrustable. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I have conquered the world. I have just won life. I really have. Cheap, cheap Uncrustables you can make yourself. Anyways, I'm learning that. I learned it. I didn't even know I knew it. It was in my soul. But there you go, parents. You are welcome. You are welcome. All right, I wanna thank Joshua and Ryan for being on the show and thank you guys so much for listening. If you have not hit that follow button to subscribe to this podcast, make sure you do it. And if you've loved this episode, share it with a friend. Also, if the spirit leads, you can leave a review. As always, make sure to take control of your money and create a life you love. <laughs>